Sonny, when did you live in Austin? <laughs> That's a funny question. Well, my stuff is still in storage there right now. I'm kind of not living anywhere. But I moved there in 96 for college. And you were there until? Kind of like now? the last the last couple months, yeah. I was thinking about just you, and I've listened to your music for years. I lived in Austin for 12 years. I listened to you when and you I, were there. And I, I'd been to a couple of your shows, but I never met you. It's so weird. Yeah, and when I walked in, you you said, and I was thinking the same thing. Like, I don't think we've ever met. I've been to at least two of your shows. That's so weird. And so, until now, I don't think we've ever actually spoken to each other. No. We've, we've been in the same city and I, the same place a couple times. And I literally listened to you, like, as a fan. Oh, you did? I didn't, see, I in, didn't know that. In Austin. Well, that... So... At some point, this was going to happen. Yeah, of Look course at it us. was. We're fine. So, the big van out there. That's mine, baby. That's a... <laughs> that is a big, that's a big, awesome van. <laughs> okay, so... That's our touring van. And um, in June of this past year, we were driving um, from Ohio. We were in my car, though, thank God. But we were coming from Ohio to Nashville and an 80, like 80 miles an hour driving down the interstate and this deer decides to commit suicide oh, and really? walked in front of us, blew the deer up. It was terrible. It totaled the car. It was mm. really bad, really tragic. So my dad and my stepdad bought me that big grill guard on the front of it for the van. So it looks like it's got a like some sort of like protection system on it. It is. Yeah. And my dad and my stepdad are like, baby, if you're driving down the road, <laughs> you are protected. Not just from deer. <laughs> like I think you can run through a building with that thing. It's like one Let's of those transformers. <laughs> yeah. Did you have a trouble getting that thing in the gate? No. Okay. Oh, I can park that in a regular spot. I can't I can't park my car in a regular spot. <laughs> I'm terrible. Well, here, also, here's what I was thinking about you. I went to the Country Music Hall of Fame four days ago. Mm-hmm. And some of your stuff is there. Listen. And if you didn't know this, I'm telling you now. I think you do know. But we saw we saw some of your stuff, and I knew you were coming in. And I was like, oh, I should bring that up. Oh, trust me. I knew and had like a shindig around it. Um, So I've been doing this for a long time, like 18 years. And there's been so many times where I've just been like, I, I'm quitting. Like, I can't do this anymore. It's too hard. Which, of course, is not ever going to be right. the case. Something will always pull me back in. And I love it. And it's the only job that I've ever loved. However, getting validation like that after 18 years and having them just randomly call when it was, I have a story for you that I'll tell you later, but like, this is one of the moments in my life where my mom was like, you know, I bounce things off her all the time. And I was like, mama, I'm just done. I can't do this anymore. It's COVID was too hard. <clears throat> like all this, it just, it sucked. Like, I don't want to do it anymore. She's like, baby, please don't. Don't do this yet. Just, you need to say a prayer, and you need to, like, beg for a sign that you're supposed to keep doing this. This is the second major thing that's happened in my life when I've done this. They called me. They had already mailed me a package with all of the invite and everything, saying they're going to put my stuff in there. But I never got it because I moved. Mm. So then the guy just randomly calls me one day and says, the curator or whatever, and he goes, hey, I don't know if you ever got this message, but... I said, I didn't ever get a message. I never got an email. I never got anything. He goes, well, that's why I was calling you. I thought you would be excited about this. But it was literally two days after I had told my mom I was quitting. And so then I thought, oh, well, now I've got stuff in the Country Music Hall of Fame. You can't so quit now. This was just like last weekend. So my whole family came up really? from Texas. Yeah. There was, was there a hat there? There's one of my like hats. A spark, like a, a it, cool looking hat. Yeah, it's Standard Hat Works from Waco, Texas. Um, it's my friend Cameron. He makes the best hats. He's like the only hat that I'll wear probably because he just, he knows how big my, like actually circumference, not how figuratively big my head is, but like the <laughs> circumference it. of my head. And, um, and so he just will sometimes just bust out like a really cool hat. And he made one for me to wear to that with these cactuses on the side. It was really cool. But anyway, yeah, he's got one. And then I've got in the display, there's that. And then my guitar that I have a bunch of signatures on. And then, um, a piece of woodwork that my dad made in reference to one of my songs called Poet's Prayer. And then um, my, because I'm trashy, I guess, but I have like a drink holder that goes on my mic stand. And um, I put that in there. Well, congratulations. <laughs> Thanks. That's super cool. And we were going through my wife's grandpa. I'd never been to the Opry or the Country Music Hall of Fame. So we did all that this weekend. I love that. And what's cool is, that, you know, sometimes 
myself, I, I take it for granted because it's here. I know. And I work at the Opry and I perform at the Opry. And then we did the Country Music Hall of Fame and walked through everything. And I saw your, and I knew you were coming in. And I was like, dang, I should remember the teller I saw. That this. makes me so happy. Yeah, it's Thanks. in the American, the American, uh, mm -hmm. American Currents or the really cool new room build out. Where yep. they have. Yeah, congratulations. Thank so you. So was that a sign to you? Was that the sign you were absolutely. looking for? Absolutely. I mean, Yes, absolutely. And, you know, the other one that happened so dramatically was um, I'm a very open book with my life and how this whole, like, music thing has transpired over the years. But um, in 2012, at the end of, we'll get into this later, I'm sure, but what I call my time on the Artist Protection Program, um, when I got dropped from Big Machine, um, I was devastated. I was like, I didn't know what to do. I didn't. I was like, do I feel like a loser? Do I feel proud that they thought I was too country? Like, I mean, what are my feelings? You know, and I could never get really my head wrapped around anything. I just knew that I was super depressed, and I, I couldn't, I couldn't really figure out um, what my plan was. And I was like, am I, am I going to need to like get a job? Like, am I going to need to like go? I have a college degree. I don't know if I can get a job doing that. But I mean what do I do? And I was just like panicking. And I told my mom, this was in 2012. And I was like, mama, I just, I'm going to quit, you know, whatever. She's like, please beg for a sign. Please beg for a sign. She goes, give yourself like a, a date, you know, like give yourself 14 days. And if you don't get that sign, she goes, you know that I will stand behind you no matter what you do, but please do this for me because I know this is what you're supposed to do. It's like, okay, fine. God, you know, like roll my eyes. So I gave myself 14 days and, um, this was, in December, and you know the music business like shuts down. Right. And um, on the last day at 5 p.m., um, the ACMs called me during everything being shut down and said that I had a, they weren't, he said, we're not supposed to call you right now, but I just felt like you needed to know this today. Um, we're not announcing it till like mid-January, but you've been nominated for an ACM without a label, without a song on the radio. It was wild. What year was this? 2012. Okay. So for so the after you've been dropped, the two three months after I got oh, dropped. Oh, that quick! Wow. Yeah. And they called you when they weren't supposed to at a time where you were giving yourself fourteen days for some. And it was some, on the fourteenth day. At five p.m. too. Mm -hmm. So what do you do when you hang up that call? Well, I was sobbing hysterically first, and um, I immediately called my mom, and I was like, "Well, <laughs> you're not." You're not going to believe this. Actually, you are going to believe this. <laughs> and, and I told her what happened, and she just, she was so excited, and she's like, I told you. And for, you know, honestly, for, for years, that little thing carried me through knowing, like, all the hard nights and all the hard, this is a hard business. Yeah. Like, I mean, you know as well as I know, like, it is, it is not for the faint of heart. And I ultimately kind of think maybe I'm like a cockroach because I just, I keep, like, <laughs> People keep trying to exterminate, you know, like use different extermination methods and all this. But I, I think my love for music just honestly like keeps me going a lot of times. And then those two events, like the Hall of Fame thing and then that, 10 years apart, by the way. You know, most people probably wouldn't admit that they tried to quit. But also like it's hard. I don't want people to think this is easy. You know, there's too many people that are trying to do this that come up and ask for advice and they say like, What's your what's your advice for getting started in the music business? I'm like, well, there's two things. Either don't mm -hmm. or be prepared to work harder than you've ever worked in your life at anything. Be prepared to be alone, even though you're with people all the time. Put your head down and just focus on what you want to happen. And then prepare. You know, it's like I saw a meme once that said, um, like, grind now so that your dog can have a good yard later. Sort of like that. Like, yeah grind now, you know, and then enjoy the fruits of your labor like later after you have been busting your ass for however long. You said something. Be prepared to be alone even though there will be people around you. What do you mean by that? I mean like working. Like I have a band. I have employees. I have all of that. And um, my partner is actually in my band. He's my guitar player. So I'm, you know, I'm not alone, so to speak. But in theory, this is the joke in my band is name on the door. So they're like, your name's on the door. Like if there's like a bad promoter or something, you know, and I have to go deal with something, it's me that has to go deal with something. So like, you know, and I, I still do my own merch. 
I ship my own merch. I, I store my own merch. Like, I do literally everything. I can back a trailer better than anyone ever in the band. And, like, I want to kind of have, like, a contest. I've thought about having a contest because there's all these, like, men that are pretty chauvinistic, not in my band, but where they're like, y'all going to let that little lady drive the van? And they're like, let her. (laughs) (laughs) Let her. My dad would, my dad's been teaching me how to drive a van since I was, you know, seven. So, anyway, like, I do, it's on me. Your job is on you. No matter who your employees are, no matter, it's always on you. Your name is the one that's on the door. If they mess up, it's your responsibility. Exactly. And if they do something bad, it comes back on you, which is why I don't have people that party too hard or do weird shit on the road or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, like, I, I don't do that. This is a business. It's a business, like, first and foremost. And it always has been, and I've always looked at it like that. And I just feel like, honestly, I mean— even this morning, I was over there shipping merch. I was just like, I don't want to give 12% of my merch away just because someone I'm capable of doing this. Right. So it's all on me. That's what I mean by being alone, like in the sense of, you know, I'm doing I'm doing the things that are making the the thing work, you know? And I've been doing it for 18 years. Yeah, you're the CFO, the CEO. You're also the face. Mm-hmm. You're all, I mean... And if anybody messes up, it's also on you. Mm-hmm. You can't really blame anybody else either. They yeah. don't come to you and say, if some drunk drummer or whatever is being a jerk, someone, they don't say, the drunk drummer from this band, they go, we're not having Sonny Sweeney's band back. That guy was an asshole. You know, like, or whatever. That comes back on me. And that is never going right. to happen. So I choose to put wonderful people around me. And the people that I have around me are, oh, my gosh. You so found a good group now? It's Everything is so good right now. So I I let everyone go 15 months ago and started again from the ground up. New all the way across? All the way across. Why do you think, or what, I'm going to ask you this, and this may make you have a little bit of a big head, but you really, it won't sound like that, but why do people believe in you, in your band? Um, Honestly, I feel like, you know, I heard, um, I heard Rick Rubin do an interview before, and you know, he doesn't play instruments, and people are like, why do you think that you are so sought after as a musician or as a producer? And he's like, because people believe me. They believe in my vision. And I feel like that's what it is with me, too, because I have been doing this for so long. And I will give anyone advice if they ask for it. I'm not one of those people that just, like, puts it out there. But there've lately, there have been a lot of young women that are in this business that have, like, that I don't know that have reached out to me and asked, like, crazy, like, kind of weird, intense questions. And I'm like, oh, let's go. Let's, like, I want to give you, I want to corner cut for you if I can in any way, shape, or form. And I just feel like you put good out into the world and you get good back. That's what I think it is. Did you have anybody that helped you like that? Oh, absolutely. When you were young, you said, hey, help me out or let me know what you know and that would help me out. Who was that for you? Um, I have like a couple of them and I call them my corner cutters. Um, Red Volkart, he's a guitar player in Austin or he moved to Virginia now, but he was one of the guys that I would share a Tuesday night with him at Egos and he taught me guitar a little bit and he was just a really good friend and he was, he played with Merle Haggard, which is my hero. And so I was, I was kind of like, man, this guy is so cool and he's, he's willing to help me and give me advice, you know, unsolicited sometimes him and then Dallas Wayne um who's a radio DJ now also on Sirius XM which I do that also um but uh he was actually at my first gig ever what first gig ever like ever ever, ever? he randomly showed up at my first gig ever because he was but how playing old were you then oh 27 and how does he randomly show up at- he was playing after me oh I was like the band it. that was playing and he came up to me Dallas did and he said, he goes, I don't know how long you've been doing this, uh, but you have really good potential, and I'd love to help you any way that I can. And I said, oh, tonight's my first gig. And he's like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> like, your first gig? I go, no, like, really? This is, like, my first gig ever. And it was at the carousel in um, Austin, you know, across from that halfway yeah. house. Listen, I know exactly where Egos is. And I know where Car- I'm I mean, sure you do, You're talking yeah. about things that, yeah. that even Mike and I know yeah. really well. We yeah, both, I mean, we- I lived there 20 years. Yeah. So, I mean, or 20-something years. So, yeah, um, yeah, I was like, I didn't, I didn't 
get into music until my first gig was 2004. Which, yeah, which is older than most to do a first gig. Yep. I think definitely you had something inside you that made you sound really um, educated quickly, music music wise. Because when I saw you, you it wasn't two maybe two years after what you just said. Mm-hmm. I didn't know you'd only be doing a couple years. Mm-hmm. And by educated, I mean it felt like you had just learned a whole lot in a, in a short period of time. Then I feel like when you're starting all the way with a song, I feel like songs are written with who they're supposed to be written with. I feel like, you know, things that you learn are learned when they're supposed to be learned. I could have learned guitar when I was 12. My stepdad, you know, begged me to let him teach me guitar. And I, I was like, that's eh, for old people. It's Because him and my uncles would sit around and play guitar. And I thought it was for old people. So when I went to college, I went to Southwest. And then when I went to college, I graduated and had a job for like 21 days. I'm like, this is not for doing me. Doing what? I worked at... Um, I worked, I worked in a cubicle at this place called Support Kids, and it's basically where you would get deadbeat parents to pay their child support. Oof. It was That's rough. That's tough. It was rough. And it was it broke my heart more than anything, like dealing with some mm-hmm. of the parents that just wanted nothing to do with their kids. And I, I thank God, have never had to deal with that. But I have plenty of friends that, you know, have parents in similar situations. Sure. And it just broke my heart. Like, it's really tragic. And so... um. I just I just called my stepdad and was like, hey, man, I think I'm ready to learn guitar. Wow. What did he say to that? He said, I'm sorry, could you repeat yourself? <laughs> <laughs> and so he went and bought me a guitar, taught me three chords, and we were coincidentally going on a family vacation that weekend. So from Austin all the way to um, Red River, New Mexico, or wherever we were going skiing, I played those three chords in the back of the Suburban just over and over. And they laugh now because they were like, you were literally driving us crazy. But we were so happy that you found something that you, you know, enjoyed doing. And um, and I've always sang. Like, I would sing at church and, you know, choir and all that. And then I, I minor, or I was going to minor in um, musical theater. Um, but then I moved to New York for two years, total side note. And I wanted to be a Broadway star. And... That's a lot harder than it seems. I, everything is, honestly. Of course. Especially when you have to be a creative. Yes. Consistent. And different. Mm-hmm. Because to do all of those, to do one of them, all right, you can be creative. Mm-hmm. But how are you going to be different? How are you going to be special? How are you going to be consistent? And also with creative people, it's really hard to find consistency. Because, Absolutely. Because we're nuts. Absolutely. You we're have, all nuts. You have to be nuts to even get in this business. Yep. And so you're already nuts. If you've decided I'm in and I'm going to keep going. Mm-hmm. And so those kind of people, like myself, like you, <laughs> it's hard to find consistency there, <laughs> even within ourselves. Uh, you were talking about, just, just to throw something in there, you're, I can tell you're an OG like me because you called it Southwest. Mm-hmm. It's Texas State, you know. Yeah, and not so, even, it's Southwest. Right. But yeah. <laughs> so when you said that, I was like, dang, that's OG. That's like, you I know, went the from, last semester before they changed the name. Really? And they asked if I wanted a new diploma. I was like, no, I didn't go to Texas State. Yeah. I went to Southwest. It's a collector's item, too. <laughs> uh, you grew up in your childhood years, like 5 to 12. What What was home like then? So my parents got divorced when I was like 4. Okay. And so then the, the family unit was different. Do you know what I mean? And as an adult, it's easier for me to see how, and I've been divorced twice. So like I see now that like not all marriage is meant to be, you know, you think it is, you have this like whatever. So my parents were not meant to be married and then they got married to other people and they're still married to those people. Um, a couple years after that. And, um, I've always had four parents, Mm. You know, and I, I sometimes feel selfish saying that because there's so many people that don't even have like one parent, but I feel like each of them gave me something. Do you know what I mean? Like, do you feel like your stepmom and your stepdad, obviously two from both units, do you feel like they both love you? Yes. I, my stepfather is, I mean, one of my favorite people in this entire universe. He's. His artwork is the one that's in the Hall of Fame. Like, he means a lot to me. And he's the one that taught me how to play guitar. He's the one that, you know, the family life on my mom and my stepdad's side was bluegrass and country and, like, Kenny Rogers and Conway Twitty is my mama's favorite. And then, like, my dad's house was 
more like Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young and Tom Petty and Stevie Nicks. And so I feel like a lot of both households, it's like by osmosis almost. Like when you learn what you like as a child, you may not even really like it. You just know what you're exposed to, Mm -hmm. which is how country music is now. I feel like people like what they're exposed to. If they were exposed to my music, I feel like more people would, you know, it's more like Americana. You know what I mean? But Which I think is the real country music if we're basing I do too. What country music used to be. I also believe in fluidity and not really assigning. But when people go, Ah, oh, it's Americana, it's not country, I'm like, Man, it's the countryest thing there is. Well, so here's the weird thing, and this is the 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 weird thing is this. So I used to say I'm a country artist. And I am. I mean, I'm from East Texas. Like I would I, agree you're a country artist. Yes. Yes. But however, I agree. however, the country that is current now is not what I do. Correct. So when I say I'm a country artist to a random person on a plane when they see me with a guitar and they're like, What do you do? And I'm like, Uh, I'm, you know, I'm a secret shopper. I mean, I'm a you know, <laughs> what do you think I am? Like, I'm just carrying this guitar around for for fun. Um but I'm like, I'm a, you know, country singer. And I used to say that. And now I just say, um, I'm a singer songwriter because I don't want, I, I am, I, I have so many beliefs about the way that, that I make music and, and I want people to give it a chance. So like, if there's someone that doesn't like current music and they only like older music, I don't want them to not give me a chance just by putting a label. Cause I'm kind of with you. Like, I don't think it should have a label necessarily. But but I am country, and I will always be a country artist. I'll always, you know, my kind of country at sure. least. So it's a really hard— I say you're country. I think so, I too. I think you're as country as could be. I, th- I think so, too, but then— But you know, sure, the, the, the popular standard of country is based on who the po- most popular artists exactly, are right now. Exactly. Your mom, you've mentioned her probably four times, mm-hmm. and we've been talking for 23 minutes. So I want to know about your mom because it sounds like she's still a great influence in your life. She is. She's awesome. Um, she's actually in Israel right now. Um, they went to Israel. To do? To go, like, to the Holy Land. Wow. Has she ever been before? No. And what motivated that? They were at church one day, and um, their preacher was like, hey, we're going to have a trip to Israel. Who wants to go? And before they even left church, my stepdad told my mom, hey, I signed us up for that. We're going to Israel. <laughs> my mom was like, we are? <laughs> <laughs> so, um. I am thrilled for them. Like, they went to Nazareth today. It's like eight hours ahead, I think. Um, they went to Nazareth today, and then tomorrow they're going to see Jesus' tomb and, like, stuff like that. I think that I tra- traveling is the reason that I continue doing this job. I love traveling. It is my favorite thing on this planet. Nothing will ever compare to it. No not the edu- process of it, though. You like getting to these places. I don't mind either of them. Really? Mm-mm. I'm not one of those. It's so weird. I know. I don't care as long as I'm in motion. I'm one of those people that's like a motion person. And like today, when we leave here, I'm literally getting in the van, going and attaching the trailer, and then we're driving to Little Rock. And I'm I'm so excited to go to Little Rock. Hey, nothing on that route. I do it about mm, six times a year. <laughs> but good luck to you. <laughs> but you know what I mean. Yeah. So they're in they're in uh, Israel, and 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 my mom is you know clearly my best friend. And you guys um, talk. All Almost the time. every day? All the time. Oh, really? More more than more than every day. What like. <laughs> about what about her makes her a great friend and a great mom? And what are you happy that you got from her? I think she's the one that always told me, you know, it sounds cliche, but like you can do whatever you want to do. As long as you really, really want to do something, you can figure out a way. And do not ever let anyone tell you otherwise. So I think the persistence aspect of it is what I got from her, like just not giving up the cockroach aspect, I guess is what we should call it. And, the, you know, her her humor is really good. And like she she can she can get no matter what I'm talking about. We can have like a conversation with our eyes in a room full of people without even talking. So to me, that's a pretty big deal, you know, to have is she that your pers- first call if something goes wrong. Oh, Yeah. For like sure. something like real, like like uh, yeah. fundamentally, if something's wrong, you call her? Absolutely. Yeah. And is she your first call when something goes right? Absolutely. Yeah. Her and, I mean, my partner, I call him, I call him, you know, unless we're together yeah, somewhere. Yeah, you're probably also with, 
with them a lot too, right? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you know, but if, if I'm like by myself and I get good news, I'll usually text both of them first and be like, can y'all call me back? <laughs> you know, I was, but I like sharing good news. <laughs> yeah. And does she text? I don't know how old oh, she yeah. is. Is she a texter? Oh, yeah. Does she use a lot of emojis? <sighs> I had to have the talk with her. Because I would imagine she's over 60. She's 70. Okay. Now, what's her emoji use like? <laughs> <laughs> These are great questions. I love this. I had to have a talk with her. I was like, Mom, one emoji is fine. You don't have to do... You don't have to do literally 17 lines of emojis all different. You know, I know you know what I'm talking about. I do, about. and that's why I ask. And I was being sensitive about, you know, I didn't know how old she was. But when I got to the text question, then I was like, I'm going in for the emojis because I feel like anybody over 60, like 63, they either don't know how to use them or they use way too many. And, and it's either one of the two. So she uses way too many. She did. And yeah. then I had to have the talk with her because I was like, if you're doing this to me, you're probably doing this to other people too. So this is annoying. So don't do that. And then what do you call it? A, a, y'all are, is it a GIF or a GIF? GIF. Yeah. GIF, like a J, but it's with a G. Correct. Okay. So a GIF. She has found the GIFs. Oh, so she hits the little, the, the little, little hourglass that pulls up all the GIFs mm-hmm. that you can send. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So she is a GIF user. <laughs> and she sent me one the other day. And it was so. She didn't watch it all the way through. You know how it sometimes oh, yeah. has words? At the end, like a penis comes up or something, <laughs> you didn't even see it. It's because you didn't. I'll do that. I'll send some sometimes, too, where I'm like, oh, this is hilarious, and I send it, and then I don't watch it, but at the no, end, there me was, too. Yeah. What did she send you? Um, it was it was not good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I had to call her and be like, Mom, do you remember when, because there was this one time, like back when VHS was a thing, <laughs> so... She would buy VHS like at garage sales because you could tape over them, you know. And, um, and she would she would tape her shows on them, you know, like when you could tape shows sure. before DVR or D, whatever it's called DVR. And um, anyway, so I am not kidding when I say this. This is a joke in my family. She was recording stuff and sending it to her sister, to me, to whoever. Like you know, she was like so proud that she could record whatever shows we wanted. They had porn on them. <gasps> so No way. Was it the, she just didn't get far. Did not get far. She just like hit record. So it's a joke in our family now. Like she, it, so like, thank God her sisters were the ones that saw it. And then my mom so called funny. everyone that she had sent a thing to and was like, don't, don't watch, watch it. this. Don't watch the end. <laughs> Turn it off five minutes before it's over. I'll tell you how it ends. <laughs> That's funny. I was going through your music a little bit ago and I saw a new song that popped up and it was a Emily Lou Harris cover. Mm-hmm. And... I'm not familiar with Jamie Lynn Wilson, but I know you guys did that song together. Mm -hmm. Why that song? What about that song stood out and and why her? So Jamie and I have been friends a long time and we were touring together in Switzerland in 2016. And it was just me and her just doing a solo, you know, song swap thing for two weeks. And um, we just on that trip did a lot of driving and we would, you know, plug the iPod in and just start listening to music. And we always were leaning towards Emmy. And so we realized that we both had this infatuation with that record, the Red Dirt Girl record. And it th- talk about procrastinator. It took us like, what, seven years to actually record it after we had initially decided, let's, we should record this. And not this the whole album, the song. The song, the song, sorry, yeah, just the song. No, but I'm saying that. You, it didn't take seven years to record. You, it's one song you're talking about. We didn't re- start recording it till about three months ago. So I'm saying it took seven years to come to fruition. Got it, got it, got it. And so then we just put it out, and um, and we, I threw, threw it all out there because every answer is going to be no unless you ask. And um, so I contacted Buddy Miller, who is, in my opinion, one of the greatest musicians and people on this earth. And I was like, hey, Buddy, um, I know this is a shot in the dark, and you're probably going to say no, but if you would possibly let Emmy hear this because I know y'all are really close. And if she's interested, would you ask her if she would maybe want to sing harmony? He goes, oh, I'll, hey, I will get it to her. I will, I will definitely get it to her. I will let her hear it. But I don't think she's doing much right now other than what's kind of on her calendar. I was like, okay, well, if you would just send it to her anyway, just see. So, Emmy Lou Harris is a huge dog person, as am I. And so 
I wrote her a letter and I sent her a picture of my dog wearing a bow tie. And um, she, this two days later, Buddy called me. He goes, you're not going to believe this. She's going to take a swing at it. So, uh, and I was like, what? And he, I go, when? And he said, tomorrow. <laughs> I said, tomorrow? Okay. And he said, would you like to come over and meet her? And I'd met her like backstage, you know, 15 years ago somewhere. But never like really talked to her. Yeah. And he goes, yeah, if you come over at one, we're going to record it. Come over at one and then, you know, you can meet her. I was like, okay. I went and sat in a laundromat parking lot for two hours before the time when he told me to be there in case they got finished early so that I could be there. And then when I showed up, I was like, oh, hey. No, oh, oh, fancy seeing you. What a coincidence. <laughs> yeah. 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 I was like, oh, no, I had a friend that lives near here. <laughs> me and the laundromat are my friend. But I was so excited to meet her. And she was so gracious. It's so sweet. And um, actually, do you know who Radney Foster is? I do. So Radney actually texted me yesterday and said that he had run into Emmy Lou a couple days ago and that she was really, really happy with how that turned out. And she came, you know, sang on it. And she said, I'm just so glad that they wanted to cut my song. That's just so, you know, flattering. And, of course, my heart's exploding while I'm reading that text message because I love her. I just, she's the coolest. She's like the ultimate cool, you know. In the Country Music Hall of Fame, they had a whole thing about her, too. I don't know if you if you saw it, but just spending time breaking down her early life mm-hmm. and how different. Because now we just go, oh, the great Emily Harris. But what she was doing was kind of radical mm-hmm. at the time. Yeah. And how she was doing her music and who she was doing it with and who and I would encourage anybody just to look her up. I mean, she kinda at times was like a hippie. Total. Like California, but country, and was taking yeah. that there and bringing that here and like working with doll. I mean She had the Albert Lee guy playing guitar with her too, which was a totally like I mean, he is a bad ass and he's just like he's oh, my guy's such a great guitar player, but like that luxury liner just I mean, if, if anyone is caring at all what I'm saying, you should listen to Luxury Liner because it is, it is like so radical, like you said. Just like it's it's so f- above its time. Yeah, I can only imagine people were like, what is she doing when she first started doing it? Mm-hmm. And then she was so great at combining styles where mm-hmm. it didn't feel like she was combining styles. It felt like she created her own path. Yeah. That she became what people tried to be like, and then it just became normal because she was so wonderful at it. Yeah, that's yeah. very true. It's very true. Never thought about that, but yeah. that's. I, I, I recently, I mean, I just spent a bunch of time, like I was at the Hall of Fame, and then I went back and kind of deep dove a little more, and it's funny you bring her up, and I didn't even know that, that she, that she sang the harmonies on that. Yeah, she's on the end of it. She's on the bridge and the last chorus. That's really cool that she agreed to do that. And it was a dog with a bow tie for sure. Because whatever you wanted from me, if you had a dog with a bow tie picture, I would say, yes. What do you need, a kidney? Yep, absolutely. You mean to sing on it? Absolutely. <laughs> Got a dog with a bow tie? I'm in. <laughs> you mentioned your very first ever performance. You said you were 27. Why did it take until 27? Or maybe 24. I don't even know. Even 24. Old. Yeah. Even if you were to say 19. Yeah. For most folks, they're, and I say this working on American Idol for four years, they'd be like, I've been waiting my whole life for this. And I'm like, bro, you're 14. That's like, what do you mean your whole life? I got armpit hairs longer, uh, older than you. So when did the music bug bite you, for lack of a better question about that? Well, so my performance, my first performance, I mean that with a band. Like yeah, I, yeah, but I, like I a d- paid with a, with a band where yeah. you're like, this is my show. I mean, I always have done like stage. Like stage has always been where I've been most comfortable. You know, I, I did... Um, you know, high school. What'd you do? Oh, every play that was available, and um, but even younger than that, like middle school plays. Um, that's why I wanted to do musical theater. Because what, was, what was the dream then? At, at I 12. didn't really, I didn't really have a certain dream. I just knew that my hometown wasn't where I needed to be to do what I wanted to do. Your hometown, it wasn't specifically Houston. Did you live in one of the suburbs? Longview, Texas, is yeah. where I'm from. So Houston's where I was born. And then we moved up to Northeast Texas, like, when I was two. Got it. Also, so, you don't really remember Houston as far as, like, growing up there. Yeah, because my whole family still lived there. So I went there all the time. Got it. Um, but Longview is very small, and um, and it's very um, quaint, and it's cute, and there's a small little county airport. And I knew that I needed something bigger than that. How did you know that? Why did you know that? I don't know. That's the weird thing. So I have a friend, actually, that passed away last year. Um his name was Heath, and me and him 
when we were still in high school, we both had this whatever this was, where we had this like vision of us leaving this town. And there was a booking agent over on um, Gilmer Road, a booking agent in my hometown. Like we don't even know really what she booked. Like we laughed about it as adults. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, he and I went there, I think our junior year of high school. And we just sat in her office and it was like Joey from Friends, you know, with the agent smoking the yeah. cigarettes. She was literally smoking cigarettes, talking to me and Heath. And she's like, so do you have a resume? And we're like, a resume? We don't know. So that was our first experience. What no, was she booking? We we wanted to talk to her about booking us in movies. Yeah, but what was she booking? We don't know. I still, now I'm curious. Like, what was she booking? I don't know that either. And he's not with us anymore. So we can't even really Dang. honestly figure it out. But um, she was this, it probably was like a casting agency for who knows what, really. But I mean, I remember where it was. And it was in this like strip center and we go in there and and Heath and I laughed about it until, you know, the last time I saw him was 2019. We laughed about it then because he is an he was an actor and all of his friends are actors out in L.A. And so he was like, hey, yo, we're the ones that actually left. We're following our dreams. Yeah. And so he was kind of like my first person that that gave me the courage to figure out what I wanted to do. I didn't know what I wanted to do. So then when I went to college, I did um, entertainment PR. So I thought, well, I'll be a publicist. That'd be a great job for me. I'd be great at this. Um, but then that didn't work out because I got bit by the wanting to do the performance part of it. And um, Did you do that at Southwest? No. Did but they have I, any productions there? Um, no, because I was just there to finish school. Like I, My parents really wanted me to finish school, and I did not want to be there. Um, but I had an internship at Lone Star Music. And um, the guy that owned the company, his name is Chad, and he's in, in a wheelchair, um, and he's a um, paraplegic. And so he would have me go out to the venues to find people to put their merchandise on our website to sell, artists. So I went to this club one night, and I called Chad, and I was like, hey, man, this guy, like, I could do what this guy's doing. I just have to learn to play guitar. Chad goes, do it. And I was like, no, I mean, like, I have to learn to play guitar. He goes, do it. So that's, you know, I I, I just kind of got really in, interested in, like, oh, all these people are, they're, they're writing songs, they're writing stories, and they're putting them to music. And I already wrote stories, so I have an English minor in college, and I'm like, I've written stories, you know, for however long I've been in college, six years. <laughs> um, if I can just play guitar, I bet I can figure this out. So that's when I called my dad, like after wow. I graduated and was like, I can, I know I can do this. And, and Paul, my stepdad, that's his name. He was like, I mean, I know you can do it. It's like no question in my mind. Well, how long did it take you to find, and obviously your voice, and I'm not talking about your physical voice, but your, your voice, who you are, what you say, what you stand for musically, how long until you kind of found what that was initially? Pretty much since I started because, um, I know what I like. I've always known what I like, which is classic country music. Um, Waylon Jennings, Merle Haggard. Um, I love that stuff. Now, that being said, I really love Tom Petty. I think he was the everything. There is a Tom Petty song for every situation. And um, Stevie Nicks, I just feel like, is the biggest style icon that's ever walked on the planet. And so kind of Loretta Lynn's talking about she was so ahead of her time. Even now, if her songs came out, they came out in the 60s. Even if they came out now, mm -hmm. people would still be shocked. I mean, the pill, look. Dude. I can't imagine that then. I know. You know what kind of uproar that caused? Oh, I, no. I, yes, but no. It's I think wild. in my head I do. I know. But I can't imagine. We're in 2023. You're talking about the 60s. I know. Putting that out. I know. I, I would imagine every super conservative... And you're talking about a time when everybody was conservative, mm -hmm. just generally, because it was the 60s. Yeah. They, they had to be shutting doors and no way you're not listening to that. Yeah. Breaking it, turning the radio. That, that's that's, that's as counterculture. That's as punk as you could possibly be. I know. And she was, she, she's the one that, that spoke for all of us. And she's the, she's the reason that I will write about stuff that's, that's taboo. Sure. She's the one that told me to write about stuff that's taboo. Well, you know, it was not comfortable for her. Uh -uh. And she kicked down so many, op kicked open so many doors and down so many walls 
for other female artists. Oh, my God. Because she's, of what she put herself through doing that. She's literally the queen for any woman that walked behind her. Now, that being said, she'll tell you that Kitty Wells was the queen that kicked every, you know, door down for her. And it just shows me that, like, it's always been a thing with women. Right. It's always been a thing. It still is. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And in, in, in 20 years, it still will be, and there'll be people like yourself. Mm-hmm. And, like, and Kitty Wells, did she have the first number one song as a female artist ever? Um, is that is that? I don't it? know. Mike, you might look that up. But yes, it wasn't God who made honky tonk angels. Was her her big? Smash. And I think that was the first. I'd be interested to know that. I actually don't know that. If I know that, Mike, because we were listening to Jake Owen and I are big classic classic. There's classic country. There's like classic classic where sometimes people forget. And yeah, Kitty Wells is in that, and we yeah. were, we were just listening to that song a few weeks ago. Is that the first? It is. I'm trying to find the exact song, but she was. Kitty Wells was. Yep. First woman to have a number one. Well, so whenever Loretta died, um, you know, it was hard for me to not say, you know, the queen. But, I mean, for me, she's my sure. queen. Um, and she will always be. And but, I had the pleasure of meeting her, and she she's the one that gave me so much advice about writing and, like, write what you know. Write what you know. It's that simple. Write what you know. Really? Yeah. Write what you know, because if, if you know it, then there's other women that know it. Sure. So. Why would you hesitate with saying, calling her the queen? Oh, because um, because she would she would probably laugh at that and be like. And say somebody else is She'd the be queen. like, oh, baby, no. Kitty Wales is the queen. You know, mm-hmm. but like, Loretta's my queen. Hands down. She's, she, she kicked down every door um, that I could have ever wanted kicked down. Because I don't think that there should be any, I think just because I'm female, Maybe it is considered crass if I sing about some of the things I sing about, or maybe it's considered taboo, or maybe, like, I remember uh, I had a song um, on my label, when I had a label, um, Big Machine was my record label. Um, I remember the the A&R person, when we were discussing songs to go on my record, she said to me, um, nobody wants to hear from the other woman. Someone just won a Grammy. Yeah, Carly and Ashley McBride. Yeah. Yeah. So I feel like it was just a little early, you know? And that's fine. Like, I I, I am so excited for, for them, like, to win that. But, I mean, there's been many songs about that. But and, I remember and Carly on the same label. Yeah, I know. Carly on Big Machine. I know. <laughs> that, that, I know. That's, that's ironic. Yeah. But I remember her saying that, and I remember saying, like, it's country music. Like, you think that, do you do you think that, just because I'm a female that nobody's going to want to hear me talk about that because there are plenty of women over the last 10 years that have come up to me saying, you know, oh, thank you for that song. You know, so it kind of does sting a little bit, but also I'm so excited that there is a time now where there are women speaking like that, you know, and saying things that I feel like need to be said, Mm -hmm. you know, and Talk, I mean, we go out. Girls go out. Girls party. You know, it's not like... Tell me more. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, it's... it's um, Especially in this business. Like, you kind of have to adapt. And it's a, it's a male-dominated business. And you have to kind of adapt as a woman in this business. And um, a couple of my friends say that when they go home to their families, that they their, their husband will be like, Oh, I see that you've got road mouth <laughs> because like, you know, girl, it's like you're in a different world when you're on the road and then you go home. You know, I don't have a family at home. So like my life kind of just stays sure. pretty consistent. But um, that's the joke with them. And but I mean, girls, girls have we have things to say. We have things to talk about. I know I do, you know, and I don't hold back on those things. And if if it's uncomfortable for you, I'm very sorry, not you, but whoever's listening, like, that's that's what music is supposed to do is bring up emotions, right? So if I have a song about one of my friends committing suicide, it's uncomfortable for me to sing it. It was uncomfortable for me to write it, but there have been people that have tattooed these lyrics on their body, you know? So it's just a very, um, it's a weird dynamic being a woman in this business. It really is. It's very... Interesting to navigate. You signed a record deal with Big Machine in 2007? Six. Six? Mm-hmm. 
So did you develop a base through the Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas kind of area touring around, and that's why they found you? Or did somebody hear you and go, we should sign you? This is the weirdest story, and you probably won't believe me. But um, so I was doing music down at, yeah, you know, played at the Poodle Dog Lounge every Sunday night. You know where that is? Jenny's Little Longhorn, all the little dives in Austin. Played at Central Market, played at the grocery store, played anywhere they would let me set up my PA. And um, then my fans that would come come to these shows, what they would say, like, you need to make a CD. I was like, I'm making a CD. Like, they're like, no, really, you need to make a CD. I had no intentions. I wanted free beer and burgers, you know, like, and that's, I was, I was eating for free and drinking for free. And like, I was living the high life. And um, anyway, so I ended up making a CD and somehow, and I, to this day, do not know how this happened because I did not even know this guy. My CD ended up on Scott Borchetta's desk. No clue how. Still, I didn't, I didn't, like, had not been to Nashville. And um, so he sends me a message on MySpace. He's like, hey, I own a record label. And I was like, this sounds creepy. It does sound creepy. It's totally yeah. sounds creepy. It didn't have a picture. It was just like the little gray head. And I was like, this sounds super creepy. But um, wow. So I looked up the record label he was talking about. And I saw that Jack Ingram was on that record label. And I've known Jack since I was 15. So I called Jack and I was like, uh, this dude just sends me a message. He's like, Sonny, call him back. He's like, what are you, crazy? He's like, yeah, that's the head of my record label. Call him back. And I was like, uh okay this is kind of weird so I called him and I was like hey it's Sonny and he's like hey um could you send me another copy of this um my wife won't let me have this one back but we would really love to see you play are you ever going to play in Nashville and I was like oh it's funny that you mentioned that I'm going to play there in like November and this was like July (laughs) he goes we're coming I was like okay he goes can you put us on the list and I was like which is was hilarious. There, was there even a list? Did you have a plan? Billy Block list? It was the Billy Block show. Do you remember Billy Block? Mm-hmm. He did like a, um, it was like a, I don't even know what it's So called. you did have a plan to be here in November, though. You didn't make that part up. No, no. It was already planned. Okay, yeah, it. I was coming to the Billy Block show. It was like a um, showcase. Okay. So I come to this gig. They come. And um, this was one month before I turned 30 years old. and Because I was born in 1976. So 2006. Um, and... At that gig, he said, I'd like you to sign to my record label. At that time, it was Jack and Justin Moore and Taylor and like one or two other people. And and I said, oh, okay. I mean, cool. I, I had no idea what I was doing. You have no, like Bobby, I really did not know what I was doing. I still don't know what I'm doing. I really didn't know what I was doing. Um, that all being said, he did everything he said he was going to do. He re-released my album that I had already put out. He didn't change anything on it. He re-released it regionally. I continued touring around Texas. And that, I jokingly call that time, because I was there for six years and I only put out one record. So I call it my time on the artist protection program. Why do you feel like that happened? I don't know. I wish that someone could explain it to me. Um, he, he gave me opportunities that I never would have had otherwise. Um, he did everything he said he was going to do. He, um, he moved, I think the tragic mistake that happened because I know Scott believed in me a hundred percent. He was like, um, I, I really believe in my heart that he believed in me. Um, he moved me over to Republic and the new guy did not like anything about me. And you weren't his find. Exactly. Which happens. All the time. All the time. And not just in music, but anything creative. Yep. Even in sports, it happens. Mm-hmm. Like a new general manager goes in, well, you ain't my quarterback. Yep. I'm going to go get my own guy. It's so a good can... analogy. Wow. So you got hit with that. Yeah. So um, so I was there from 2006 to 2010 um, or n- nine on Big Machine. And then Scott called me into his office one day and said, oh, there's this new sister label we're opening and I'm going to move you over there. It's going to be great for you. And I remember the sinking feeling in my stomach going like, no, no, no. I've already put in time with you. I want you to believe in me. And then as I predicted from minute one of meeting the person that was the head of the other label, he didn't like anything about me. He didn't like my look. He didn't like my voice. He didn't like 
like my actual voice. He didn't like my songs. I wonder why you get put over there if I don't there know. wasn't a conversation and whomever was running it. I was like, hoping you would be able to tell me. Yeah, <laughs> I, it, that, that, it's weird to me that that would happen because there had to be a conversation between whomever the governing bodies of those labels yeah. are. But a lot of times, you know, things just happen. You know, like I guess. choices just get made. For and you, it, it was made for you, obviously. Absolutely, and you know, um, I'm a big girl. I'm a, I'm okay. Like I survived. I continue to survive. That's my my whole thing is survival. But what was wrong? What was what was wrong with you? Um, I didn't sell enough because I was country. That's why I got dropped. So your style then was, in my opinion, ahead of its time. I hope I hope that I would t- take that as a compliment, honestly. Oh, for sure. And you know, people that are so early are often penalized mm-hmm. when they're so right and so progressive at the time, but it literally is what's about to be the biggest thing. God, you're so you're so spot on. They're often penalized and treated like they're just garbage being thrown out because people don't get it yet. It actually takes other people consuming it over a period of time to go, "We like it. We get it." For even them to go, "Oh, I mean, Bobby, I feel like, tell me if you think I'm wrong. People like what they're exposed to. For sure. Like, it doesn't matter if it's what or what. It's like, if you listen to something enough times, it's going to get in your brain, right? Uh, Yes. uh, Yes. With uh, with the caveat of it just... It just can't be bad. Well, sure. But yes, anything that is in that upper... I've had the conversation with my bosses, and I don't program music anymore. I just... Go, I just try to do compelling content, right? Sure. I try to yeah. be funny. I try to be compelling in many ways. But I've had the argument with them. Like, if you really believe in a song, you just play it enough times, it's going to be a hit. That's what I think, too. If you, li- if you believe in it and you literally just play it enough times, yep. you, you can pound it into people's head. Yep. So I agree with you in that way. Yes. So go, okay. So so that all happens. So, so this is when Concrete, my album, was out with, it had, like, From a Table Away on there. There were stands worse than leaving which I was also told was needing to be pitched to a man that no one would want to hear a woman sing about leaving. I've made a career on that. Um, and then um, the next one that was on the radio was Drink Myself Single, which is a, a bar, like, honky-tonk, super country song. Even for my standards, it's country. So those were my three singles that were out. And um, I did not... I, I didn't... I learn as I go with pretty much everything. And... Um, in 2012 also, you know, the whole New Faces Mm -hmm. showcase or whatever. So I don't know what that is. I have no clue what that is at this point. And I know that the labels, the label that I was with were pushing other artists. I guess the labels kind Mm -hmm. of barter, or not barter, but like garner for a jockey for a position. They'll put more of their promotion time money and wait to certain into artists it. right yeah so they did that with a couple of artists that were on big machine in, in republic and not me and i had radio people that i had met over the year you know year that i'd been on the road promoting my single that i had kind of really liked and like stayed in touch with and i think i'm pretty easy to get along with and i, I love meeting people and making friends and so i had stayed in touch with some of these people well some of these people were calling me going why is your label not putting you up for these things? And I was like, I don't even know what you're talking about. But, I mean, whatever. You know, it happens. I'm not going to be mad about it. Like, my time will come. That's I always think that. And so the the nomin or whatever it's called come out, and I'm on the showcase without anything, nothing, no help, no bartering, no nothing. And, um whatever it's called. And so I remember at that showcase, that was, when does that happen in the spring? It uh, happens now. It's like two days here now. Okay. So yeah, it's so spring. spring. Yeah. So I remember we did the showcase. It was awesome. And I remember I had already put three songs out and I knew it wasn't doing what they wanted it to do. And Scott came backstage like, you know, oh, my God, this was the greatest show I've ever seen of you play. We're going to put another single out. And I said, really? Like, because I thought I had already kind of felt that, like, I have a little bit of discernment where I can kind of read people and feel the next move, sort of. And I kind of felt that they weren't feeling it anymore. 
And so when he said that, it kind of gave me a second burst of energy where I was like, wow, maybe this is going to work, you know? And, and I got really excited about it, and then he didn't ever do it. And I'd asked, I asked about it, and he's like, yeah, we decided not to. Cool. Okay. All right. And then I'm kind of back to square one. Well, then two months later, he drops me after I've been on the new wow, faces. Wow, you got a new face, and then you two get Two months dropped. later. Yeah, new faces means that radio, label, promote, that they believe in you, and they've kind of anointed you as one of the big new faces, like yeah. together. That I've never heard of that happening. Like and then you do that show. And then three months after that is, or four months after that is when I got the ACM nomination without a label, without a song on the radio. Yeah, that is a weird, like CRS, new faces, big deal. <laughs> Huge deal. Usually people go, we need to invest more in that person because obviously people believe in them. We drop you. Two months after that. ACMs, we shall lift you up again. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty up and down little span of months there. Yeah, so it it was pretty heavy on my yeah, heart. I get it. You know, and it was pretty like, if I can survive that, that's why I laugh now when, you know, people try to like um, give you the lowdown on something that's about, you know, this person you're about to meet, blah, blah. I'm like, <laughs> I got it. <laughs> Please, I'm good. <laughs> I, I have handled so much worse than this. Like, you have no idea. Do you enjoy playing shows now? It is my favorite thing on this earth. I feel like yeah, it's almost, I, I like I, when you talk about certain things, your eyes light up. And when you talk about playing now, it's almost like you've been reintroduced to how awesome it is. It, it is the only thing on this planet. Okay. I play guitar and I write songs. If my entire world is taken away from me tomorrow, my band, my house, my car, you know, my friends, my family, I still have a guitar and I still have a brain. So I can literally do this for the rest of my life. As long as my, you know, fingers work and my brain works, I can travel the world and play music. Now, that being said, I would much prefer to do that with my friends. You know, yeah. we have a great time together. And I'm one of those people that I don't really care if, I mean, I do care if it's not a great, like, crowd. But I, I will do the same show, whether you're the only person there or if you brought 3,000 friends with you. I love my job. I have like six friends, but if I had 3,000, <laughs> we would come. I just don't want you to get confused. You I don't what? have that many friends. I have like six friends okay. too. So <laughs> I was just in theory I saying I got that you. if there's 3,000 people there or three people there, mm -hmm. um, I think starting out in, in bars with drunks and, you know, I never assumed that I, when I started, I never assumed that I would have different kinds of fans. I thought it would be like the one lonely guy in the back. And his drunk girlfriend um, screaming Tanya Tucker songs at me from across the bar. Or, you know, I thought it would be like the random kind of hipsters that would show up at the carousel. I never imagined that fans would become so instrumental in my life, especially during COVID. These people kept us on our, they kept a roof over my head. I am not exaggerating. Like, I am really not exaggerating. We did, they, I sold more merch mm. during COVID than I probably sold the year before that. People so, just going, we got you. We got you. Mm -hmm. You know? And, um, man, I just never figured that, that I always knew that fans were, I mean, obviously the only reason that any of us do our job. Because if you don't have people listening to you, what happens? You don't, uh, I don't get to talk anymore. So I'm saying, yeah. if I don't have people, you know, listening to me, buying things, whatever, it makes it really hard to do things. So I know how important they are. I never knew how important they are. And COVID really made me see that and made me feel it more than anything. And it is, it is the best feeling on this planet knowing that there's random people in this world that I've never met that somehow maybe – have been touched by anything that I've done, even if it's just one thing. Right. I used to have guilt about that. Where? Why? Well, it, and here's the reason why, but here's how I figured out that I shouldn't have guilt. But I used to have guilt because, like, the listeners of the show, people who read my books or whatever the case is, 
They've been so generous with lots of stuff over my career. And again, I'm just a trailer park kid. I grew up in a really yeah. rural town, didn't have anything. And they would always come to shows or donate to causes that I believed in and using their own time and their own money. And I would feel really guilty for the same reason going, man, they don't even know me and they're doing this. Mm -hmm. But they know parts of me that I put out there and I would go, man, I just feel bad that they're doing anything. However, then I started to go, okay, well, let me just flip the perspective here. Are there people in my life that I don't really know that if they were like, hey, of course, yeah. there are people that have been an influence in my life that I've never met. And if they were having a difficult time or a different time and they, yeah. and I saw it coming from a really authentic place, heck yeah, I would have, I would have done that for them. See, I think that's good. That has a lot to do with heart, your heart too. Like, cause I, I have a sensitive heart and I feel that way too. I feel, I think that may be actually nail on the head for me why I feel that way. Because it's like, I wish that I knew them all by name mm -hmm. so that I could do something for them. I you struggle know? with accepting it for a long time. Uh, oh, God. Even accepting, accepting them giving to, uh, things I cared about that were like charities, I still was like, that's your money. I can't believe, I couldn't believe. I feel guilty you're even doing it. I know. Until I said, well, would I do this for people that have been instrumental to me? And I would mm -hmm. if I had it. Yeah. And so I don't know. Sometimes I think I have a black heart. Like <laughs> you a, do a, de not. a dead oh. heart. Like there's just a, just been through, <laughs> been through some crap and it's all numb at this point. <laughs> but that to me was what made me feel like it's okay. Mm -hmm. I, I can 100% get behind that. Because I think that's what it is for me. And like, you know, I did, I've done fundraisers before. For I'm a huge animal person. I mean. Yeah, me too. Oh, God. Um, we worked with Austin Pets Alive on a level. Oh, me too, for, Bobby. Uh, I mean, years and years and years and years and years. So good. Yeah. It's, an animal is like a baby. And like, it's the most helpless thing on this earth. And they don't have a mouth, so they don't have words, so they can't tell you what's wrong. And it's our job as humans, I think, and that's why I feel like I was put on this earth, is to figure out a way to help animals. Like, I just love animals. And I saw this little kitty in Baton Rouge one time, and it had been hit by a car. Its leg was all mangled. Oh, I don't like Oh, that no, name. this is the best story ever. Okay. And I'm my band. In the arms of an angel. <laughs> Sarah McLaughlin starts playing in the background. <laughs> Go ahead. So um, my band goes, I, I said, y'all, this cat is screaming at me. It's only looking at me. They were all standing there, and it's this big. It's like five pounds. And it was screaming. And I have video of it that I will not show you. And, and I said, if it's alive in the morning, we're doing something. This is on its deathbed. And so these two girls pull up, and we don't have any food in our car. We're in the middle of, like, somewhere no no gas station nothing there's no food none of us had food i had a granola bar which wouldn't eat so i asked these girls panicky i was like hey do you all have any food for this little cat i think it's about to die and they gave me a waffle so i got it some water gave it a little waffle broke it up in little pieces and my drummer called me the next morning at like seven o'clock he goes yo uh your little friend is still outside and i was like damn so all right so i got up and i put on facebook Hey, y'all, there's this cat. Here's a picture of it. Do what you do. I need I need a cat rescue in Baton Rouge, you know. So within 10 minutes, this guy has written me back. He said, oh, I'm a cat rescue. Mm. Comes and gets it. He goes, man, this cat's on its last leg, literally. And I go, yeah, I know, um, but I can't leave it here to die. It cannot happen. I can't do anything with it. Can you just take it? And he goes, you know what? I'm going to call Angel Rescue and see if they'll take it. So they take this cat. Um, they called me two hours later and like, this cat needs its leg amputated and I think we'll be good to go. So I go on Facebook and I was like, oh my gosh, y'all aren't going to believe this. Wow. The, the cat's going to be fine as long as they get its leg amputated. I was ready to put it on my credit card. Someone started a fund thing for it. Within minutes, I had $6,000 wow. for this cat. Long story short. Cat is now living the high life. It is named Sunny Sweeners, <laughs> and it is living with my friend John, who we flew it to D.C. to live with him. He's now moved to Nashville as of like two weeks ago, but the cat now lives in Nashville. It is the man of the house. Wow. It is the most gorgeous cat. It has three legs. It walks on a leash outside. Mm. It is 
the most gorgeous story. And we made T-shirts that were, you know, I have a fan page called The Trophy Room because one of my records is called Trophy. And um, anyway, uh, we made these little trophy T-shirts for the cat, and we sold those to to give the animal rescue that did all the work the profits from that. And um, anyway, it's a totally— That's a great story. That's a great story. That's what I needed to hear. Yeah. I don't need mangled cat leg to end like that. Well, <laughs> that's the last we saw of it. Mangled. <laughs> then we drove off. Wait, what? We left it hungry on Why the side of the I road. Why did I feel sad after the Sunny interview, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're headed to Little Rock because you have a show there. I'm going to just read off some of the cities you're going to be in. Um, Little Rock, Stonewall, Texas, Albany, Fort Worth, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, Houston, Galveston. Are well, you doing a lot, of, a lot down there, huh? Just actually, that's weird. This month, we're in Texas. We're usually not. But Galveston, though. Oh, we're doing a cruise. That's why it's so many days in a row. Yeah. I was like, dang, Fort Niner in Galveston. Okay. <laughs> Austin, San Antonio. Uh, listen, you're all over the place. And we had talked about uh, the record and the song with Vince Gill, Married Alone, before you came in. And I love Vince. I do, too. He's the greatest. He's the best singer on the planet. Yeah. He just And just his presence, soft and also, not like, read not his skin. His presence. <laughs> Like it's he soft, uses the best lotion but ever. It's also like <laughs> strong and like comforting, and you just know he's seen it all. I mean, he plays and sings with the Eagles. I know. And then he goes to the. I saw him with the Eagles at the Irwin Center. I saw him with the Eagles at Bridgestone. It blew my freaking mind. I know. So you, you guys check out Married Alone. We talked about it earlier before you were here. But those are a lot. A lot of those, if not all of them, were unreleased songs that you had had. Is that is that right? Or some of them were. What do you mean? I, I on my album? Yeah, on that Married. Was, was it all new stuff? That Married Alone. Um, it was all new songs. But had you had any of them written for a long time? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, um, I have a running list of, in my phone, of songs that just, some of them are 15 years old. That's what I mean. Like, you had them for a long time. You just some hadn't them. cut them yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But Mary, What was the oldest song you had on there? Um. Like, that you held for so long because it meant so much oh, to you, you just couldn't easy. Find. Someday you'll call my name. And when did, when do you think you wrote that? I know when we wrote it. Uh, me and my friend Brennan wrote that in, like, 2008. And why did it take so long to cut? Because it it wasn't good. And so we rewrote it during COVID. Mm. We literally took the title and rewrote it during COVID. Well, there was something about it that just... The the chorus was there. And we knew the chorus was good. Um, but I, I wanted it to be about something else. It was about something and we wanted to change the topic of it. And so, um, so we rewrote it over Zoom during COVID. And the day we wrote it, I was like, cool, that's going on my record. Like, it's so weird how that happens. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you just know. And then um, before it even came out, that was in that. Do you remember the movie that came out over the summer called Vengeance with B.J. Novak? Yes, he's a, pod, he's a podcast guy. Yeah. I didn't watch it, but is yeah, that it? You liked movie. it, right? I love it's, that movie. Yeah, me too. So it was in that. They put it in that movie. Well, I have to, I'll for sure have to watch. Mike keeps telling me the movie's really good. It's great. And my dad and I went for Father's Day last year to New York to Tribeca Film Festival to see it for the first time. That was like the premiere of it. And it's in it? Uh-huh. How, did, how do you get in that movie? Who pitches that? How does that happen? Um, does somebody hear it? Does... I, I, I honestly, it was one of those things where I was like, well, it's not even out. Like how yeah, exactly. on earth? How on earth? Um, but yeah, it just got pitched and the music supervisor liked it and put it in the rodeo scene. So it's pretty wild. That's super cool. I was really excited. That's what I would love to get into is, you know, that kind of stuff. Like get into you know, sync and like do um, TV and film. I have a friend who is a songwriter in town and he's like, you know, I'm just going to take this year and dedicate it to sync. And I was like, so what does that mean? He goes, well, I've started creating these relationships with these. And so he, he kills it now. He writes songs for cruise commercials or movies or. Whoa. Yeah. That's awesome. He was like, you know, I was writing a lot of songs and some of them would get on hold. Maybe one would get cut. Yeah. I'm in a pub deal. Mm-hmm. And he's like, I'm just going to write for Sync for a year. And now it's like five times the money he was making. And he's also still getting to and do what he loves. And he's got control of his life. Yes. <laughs> he does. And he's got control of yeah, his life. Yeah, but if you come off the road, you're not going to be the same. You want to stay on the road. Oh, look, I do everything on the road. Everyone's always like, for, since day one, people have always, you know, I do, you know, writing appointments when I'm in Nashville or in Austin or whatever. And um, people are like, well, when you're off the road, do you, or when you're on the road, do you need to like, you know, just be on the road. I was like, no, I do a radio show every morning from the road. I write songs on the road. I, f- when I'm under pressure, I am a much more like productive person. 
So the more that I can do, mm-hmm. that's why I think I don't mind honestly doing all of the things because control freak though. N- I mean, probably I am because I'm scared if I don't do it, it won't get done. And if it doesn't get done, I'll fail. I'll be a failure again. Do you want me to tell you one thing though? I definitely am a control freak in it's because it's my name. I want it done right. And I know if I do it, it will be done right. I have found there is my tour manager now is the first person that I have ever trusted to do certain things. And not only does she do them, she kicks their butt. She is, it is like having another brain Mm. and two more sets of hands. You know, like she is a machine. She has changed my life so, and just so dramatically. And her name is Elisa. If you're listening, Elisa, uh, she is the best thing that's happened to me as far as like, Being able to delegate something, and I know with no question in my mind that it will get done properly. And if she has a question, she'll call me and be like, is this how you want it done? Like, actually, no. Could you try this? And she'll be like, oh, my gosh, yeah, that's perfect. It is awesome. I feel the same way about Mike, except he doesn't ask me if that's how I want it done. He just does it better than I would have done it to begin with. (laughs) That too. (laughs) But I never trusted anybody with anything with shows or anything I was doing. Isn't that weird? Ever. And I was like, okay, I'm finally going to give this baby bird to Mike and see if it flies. But you, but you, then you see it surviving and then all of a sudden not only surviving, it's flying around Mm -hmm. and beating people over the head with its wings. (laughs) Hey, I'm here. <laughs> and then I feel less than because Mike's better than I am. And he's like, well, I would do that. Oh, Way to go, Mike. Why didn't I do that? <laughs> well, look, we've we've been here for an hour, 15 minutes. I've enjoyed this so much. Me too. You're just a you're just a jar of fun. Oh, like so you are want you. you just it, it's so your spirit's just there. Thanks. You know, so here's what I'm gonna say. You guys go follow Sunny. She's you know getting swingered on Instagram, but you're your own name on TikTok, right? Yeah, and Facebook. And getting sweenered is Twitter and Instagram. Yeah, I'm confused, but I got you. It's all on my website. If you, it's all linked. That's even easier. Yeah, it's linked on my website. Just because I didn't realize when I made those names that those would be like. I know. So stupid. I wish I could change it now. I know. Uh, But it's been years in the making that we finally met. I I know. I've been to two of your shows. And I've listened to you way before you ever did this. So like when you were back in Austin. And Mike, Mike was like, "Hey, Sonny's gonna be." And I was like, "Really." That's I'm super, so happy. That's super cool. And then when I saw your stuff at the Country Music Hall of Fame, I was going to remember to say it, and then I forgot, and then we started talking, and then I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. And then it got us on to Lou Harris. This has all kind of happened organically, which is super cool. Yeah. So thank you. You ask really good questions, too. I I don't know that I asked anything. I just kind of let— But, I mean, like, you you don't—you do ask, like, the actually, you ask the right things. You ask things that make people want to talk. Well, I appreciate That's that. That's what I, when I listen to you, I'm always like, oh, that question is going to make this person say this. You know, like it's it's good. You're really good at oh, your job. You. I know you know that, but like it's really fun. Same to you. You're thank really you. good at your job. Thank you. So, Mike, anything you want to say? Uh, could you teach me how to back up uh, a trailer? <laughs> yes. I want to do it on, I want to do it on a live feed. I want to do that. I mean, I have trouble with my Ford Focus, so I need some Oh, help. no. It's much easier to back a trailer than to back a regular car. Yeah, I don't think so, because I had, had to pull trailers, boats, uh, mowers, and I sucked. Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I messed up a couple of them. Yeah, wow. what, what are they... I think I could give you some pointers. Yeah, I'm sure you could. Watch me, like, hit your gate on the way out. <laughs> Hilarious. <laughs> Hilarious. All right, you guys, go follow Sunny. Go to SunnySweeney.com. Uh, the song they just went up, Red Dirt Girl. It's an Emily Harris cover. And then also her album, which we just talked about, which came out uh, middle-ish end of last year. Right? Uh, September. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, middle-ish end of last year. That counts like as that it. term, middle-ish right? middle-ish end. Yeah. Uh, Married Alone, and that song also has Vince Gill on it. And it's not only just the name of the album. Sonny, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah.